Amen. Well, good morning again, Hillside. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, would you turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6? Uh, and today we will be in verse 17. In fact, we will just be uh, studying the first half of verse 17, which is six words. And you might be wondering, how is that possible? And I'll show you. Um, it's, <laughs> there's a lot in here. And so we're just looking at the first six words of verse 17 today. As you're turning there, I would like for us to again remember something that we've worked very hard to keep at the front of our minds for the last probably five weeks of this sermon series. And that is this, as Christians, um, or as people who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, if you've done that, if you are in Christ, then you need to know this, we're in a very real spiritual battle against a very real enemy. If you have been here for the last month, I would guess that you're probably tired of hearing me say this, but I believe that it's essential for us to remember this reality, that we're in a very real spiritual battle against a very real enemy. It's essential because it's important for us to know that this is just not some sort of fringe Christian truth. It's, it's important for us to understand that the enemy wants to attack us. For reference, look again with me at Ephesians chapter 6. Verses 10 through 12, which we started studying weeks ago, but verse 10 says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Why would we need to stand against the schemes of the devil? Well, Paul answers that question for us in verse 12 where he says this, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So remember with me that Paul is telling us here that the same grace that has reconciled us to God, the thing that he was talking about in the first three chapters of this book of Ephesians, that same grace that has reconciled us to God, that grace also antagonizes us to the evil one. And so it would be very naive of us to fail to recognize and understand that when we become followers of Jesus Christ, we are then immediately introduced to spiritual warfare. Satan desires to steal and kill and destroy. Now, I've said this the last couple of weeks, but let me say it again, especially if you're new and you're like, what is this guy's problem? He's a, what a joy sucker. I understand that this isn't great news to hear. But as we've been saying now for the last three weeks, there is very good news in here. And that is this, the great news of the armor of God, which we've been studying now for the last three weeks, is this. And we've said this over and over. The gospel is not self-help. That's the good news. And so Paul isn't saying, hey, listen, you're in a war, so get some training. He's not saying, find armor and just be a better Christian. He's clearly saying this, you are in a war, the devil wants to kill, steal, and destroy. And so stand in what you have been provided in Christ. You've been provided with armor from God in Jesus Christ. You've been provided with the resources that you need to stand against your enemy. Well, what are those resources? I know not everybody has been here the whole time, and some of you have, but let me just remind some of us or get us up to speed here. Paul has told us so far that here are the resources that you can put on. He said, put on the belt of truth. Maybe you remember this, but the Roman soldier in Paul's day would have taken this thick leather war belt and he would have tightened it and used it to cinch up his tunic so that the tunic didn't trip him up in battle. For us, in the same way, the believer tightens the belt of truth. We're bound tight with God's word. Why? So that we won't be tripped up in this battle. With the truth of God's word holding our lives together, we can confidently stand against the enemy. Second, Paul said, put on the breastplate of righteousness. The Roman soldier would have put on his metal breastplate to protect his heart from the deadly short sword during battle. And for the believer, we put on this breastplate of righteousness to protect our hearts from the blows of the enemy. 
This righteousness that we put on, and I think this is really important, is the righteousness that comes from God through faith in Jesus Christ. It's what theologians call imputed righteousness. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says it like this, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, this was Jesus, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so this happens for the Christian warrior's heart when we put on this righteousness. And when we do, our heart is impervious to the attacks of the enemy. God's righteousness protects our lives. Third, Paul said that we need to put on gospel shoes. The Roman soldier would have put on his nail-studded boots in order to be able to stand his ground in battle. And so for us, these boots of peace that the Bible calls uh, them give us this sure footing of the gospel, which is the peace that we can have with God. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says it like this, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God through faith, and then also these boots of peace give us the source of footing of the peace of God. Jesus said it like this in John chapter 14, verse 27. He said, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. And so Christ gives those who live in light of the gospel of peace, peace with God and the peace of God. With these gospel shoes, we're grounded in our peace with God and the peace of God. The fourth, fourth piece of armor, the one that we studied last week, is the shield of faith. The Roman soldier would have picked up this shield to catch the enemy's barrage of flaming arrows. And for us as believers, this shield is faith in God and faith in his word. Through faith in the power and the promises of God, the warrior binds himself close to the heart and the purposes of God. And when he does this, both individually and in community, these burning arrows of doubt and disbelief and anxiety and intimidation are harmlessly extinguished. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 says it like this, And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So, so far, Paul has pointed out to us the reality that truth, righteousness, peace, and faith are our armor in the battle. And I want us to, again, notice that not one of these pieces of armor is ever calling us to self-help. Not one. All of them are continually pointing us to the source of truth and the source of righteousness and the source of peace and the source of faith. Truth comes from God, righteousness that is God's, peace from God and peace with God, and the faith is faith in the power and the promises of God. What an incredibly divine armor. How could we add anything to this? How could God add anything to this? What could possibly be added to this incredible list of armor? Well, today Paul adds one more piece of defensive armor that is equally essential for us as believers, and it is the helmet of salvation. Look with me at verse 17, the beginning of it, which is our text for this morning. It says this, And take the helmet of salvation. And take the helmet of salvation. Paul says again, because of the spiritual battle that you're in, you need another piece of armor. And today he says, take the helmet of salvation. In order for us to understand this piece of spiritual armor, let's again quickly just look at what the purpose of a Roman soldier's helmet was in ancient battle. Roman military helmets were made of tough iron or bronze with cheek guards. I drew this picture for you guys too. Cheek guards and with an <laughs> inside lining on this helmet of a sponge so that it made the weight of the helmet bearable. When a helmet was strapped in place, it, it basically only exposed the eyes and the nose and the mouth. These helmets were so weighty that some of us do not have the neck muscles to hold them up. I'll put myself in that category too. In fact, these helmets were so heavy and they were so strong that history would tell us that virtually the only weapons that could penetrate them were axes. So when the Roman soldier suited up for battle, he put his helmet on, and the very last thing he did was put this helmet on as an act of readiness, and when he had it on, confidence came with it. 
And as obvious as this might sound, the helmet was vital for the survival of a Roman soldier. In battle, when the sky was filled with arrows and javelins and swords and swinging axes, the helmet is what enabled a man to stand confidently. I'm sort of having this, um, I'm just memory. I remember the first time I got my first helmet. It was a Nebraska football helmet. Let's go. Um, One of those little kid plastic ones, though, which very clearly say, do not use these for contact sports. And I remember at eight years old putting it on and ramming my head into a brick wall, checking out the helmet. It, it, it gave me confidence. <laughs> now, some of you are like, that explains a lot. <laughs> and some of you are like, remember the N on the side of a Nebraska helmet stands for knowledge. So <laughs> I get it. All right. You, don't, you can keep your jokes to yourself. But helmets give confidence, a good one especially. And I think it's fair to say that a good helmet is a confidence builder for lots of us. When it's properly worn and when it's properly used, it affords remarkable protection. I think of all of the armor, we probably understand the value of a helmet the most. It protects the head and everything in it. In fact, when I send my kids out on a, to ride a bike, it is always, do you have your helmet on? That's important. We understand the value and the protection of a helmet. But the question that we need to answer today is, what is Paul saying when he tells us as believers in our spiritual battle that we know we're in to take up the helmet of salvation? Today, I want to address this question by answering really three questions throughout the course of the morning, and here they are. Why do I need the helmet of salvation? What is the helmet of salvation? And then how can I continually put this helmet on? These are our three questions. The first question to answer this morning is this, why do I need this helmet of salvation? And in order for us to understand why this helmet matters so much, we need to see again, this is a question I asked last week, but I'm going to say it again, We need to see again the hostility that we face. Needing to have a helmet on our head indicates to us that some of Satan's most fatal blows towards believers are aimed at our minds. And so while this can sound like a broken record, I'm sure to those of us who have been here over the last month, we need to know that Satan aims his attacks at our minds. Why? How? Well, generally speaking, he uses the big weapons of discouragement and doubt. If if he can plant discouragement and get you and I to doubt the goodness of God, then ultimately he can get you to question the assurance of your salvation. Why are these his methods? Well, because if the evil one can strike a blow against us to become discouraged and filled with doubt about our security in Christ then he will have little trouble sidelining us in kingdom work. Hear me really clearly on this. The evil one always attacks Christians at the point of our assurance. He he would love to leave us all tied up in knots wondering these kinds of questions. Does God love me or does he love me not? Am I saved or have I fallen away? Am I saved or have I backslidden right out of the back door of the kingdom? Am I in Christ or am I out of him? Am I justified or am I not? Am I God's child or am I not? Have my sins or my failures or my problems in my life affected God's love for me? Is it possible that I have finally out the grace and the goodness of God? As a pastor, and honestly, even personally, but as a pastor, it's been very common for me to meet with people who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ, and these people legitimately wonder if they have out the grace and the goodness of God. They've been caused to doubt whether God could have saved them in their darkness, and we need to understand something about this. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, 
This attack against the assurance of your salvation is an attack that Satan delivers often to the minds of Christ's followers. He, he loves to plant doubt. He aims to discourage And this is why Paul says to Christ's followers, it's essential that we take up the helmet of salvation. It is essential because the enemy attacks the mind, and so you need to protect your mind. Okay, well, you might say, I get that. A good helmet is necessary to protect your head. That's logical. I understand the value of a helmet. But what is this helmet of salvation? How can it protect me? And this leads us really to our second question, and that is this. What is the helmet of salvation? Well, to understand what Paul means, we need to understand the word salvation. Here's a brief definition of what Paul means when he says salvation. Salvation means that God has rescued you from the penalty of sin. He is rescuing, rescuing you from the power of sin, and he will ultimately rescue you from the presence of sin. In order for us to understand what this means, we need to think correctly about salvation. Now, we could, I think we could probably go for days on the subject of being saved from the penalty of sin, from the power of sin, and ultimately from the presence of sin. But for our purposes this morning, I really just want to share two things with us about salvation that I believe are basic essentials for us to understand what Paul means when he says, put on the helmet of salvation. And the first thing is this, in order to understand salvation, we need to see the need for salvation. We have to see the need for salvation. Or another way to say it would be, in order to understand salvation properly, then you and I must take the doctrine of the fall seriously. Salvation is a radical word. It really is. We make it commonplace in our world, but it is quite radical. Why do I say that? Because to be saved, you and I must be helplessly and hopelessly lost. When we talk about salvation in our text, Paul is talking about the reality that God rescued you from a condition where you could do nothing to rescue yourself. You were helplessly, hopelessly lost. You were radically lost. Maybe you remember how Paul said it in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. It's been a while now since we studied this, but he said this, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. You were dead, spiritually dead, zombies. And I know that this can sound quite obvious to some of us, but dead people don't make themselves alive. They don't save themselves. We need God to save us. Before God began to work in your life, you didn't know that you were lost and you didn't desire to be saved. The Bible says you were not seeking God. In fact, the Bible says no one seeks God. And this is why the word salvation is so radical. Because when God began to work in your life, when the Holy Spirit began to convict you of sin and righteousness and judgment, he opened your eyes to see your true guilt before God. He showed you the impossible standard of perfect righteousness. And you began to see your need for salvation. It's important for us to remember this. In order to appreciate the protection of the helmet of salvation that God provides in Christ, then we must take our, our falling condition seriously. Why? Because if we have no need for God, then we will never see the value and the protection of the helmet of salvation. To understand the reality of salvation, we have to understand our need for it. And then secondly, to understand salvation, we need to understand that salvation is a gift, not something that we can earn or merit. Look again at verse 17a. It says this, and take the helmet of salvation. The word take here literally means receive, accept, or welcome. It implies that what we saw earlier in Ephesians, that salvation is God's gift. So Paul said this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5, after he said you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Chapter 2, verse 5, he says, Even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Grace means that salvation is an undeserved favor or gift. 
To make sure that we understand this vital truth, Paul actually repeats it in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. He says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And I know that this can sound overly simple to those of us who have been in church our whole lives. I get that. But this is the profound reality of the gospel that Satan would love for us to forget this. And here's this profound reality. Salvation is a gift of God. So many of us work to earn our salvation. And when we do this, we miss the reality that we receive by faith the gift of what Christ did for us on the cross. In order for us to receive salvation, we have to let go of our good works as the basis for our acceptance with God. What is your job in salvation? It is to trust Christ alone. And this is the good news of the gospel, the gospel of our salvation. The good news is that all who believe, all who receive this salvation can rest in the finished work of Christ. And this is what Paul means when he says, take the helmet of salvation. He's saying, understand that you need it. You are hopelessly, helplessly lost. And two, understand that Christ provides it as a gift to you. Taking the helmet of salvation means taking the assurance of our salvation, taking the reality that we need it, and then understanding that it rests squarely upon Christ and his sacrifice on the cross, it never, never, ever, ever, is that enough, will rest on your merit. When we put on this reality that our salvation is found by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, it is at that point then that we are protected against the enemy's very real attacks upon our minds. Satan has no answer to Christ's work on the cross on your behalf. Can he accuse you of failing? Yes. Can he accuse Christ of failing? No. The third and fi- sorry, I'm yelling at you. The third and final <laughs> third and final question that I want us to answer this morning is this. How do I continually put this helmet on, on in my own life? What do I do? The enemy is an accuser. I need the protection over my mind. Jesus is the only answer. How do I daily protect or put this helmet on and strap it down tightly in my own life? Let me give us three things. I think there are probably many more that we can do to put this helmet on and keep this helmet fastened and functioning. The first one is this, renew our minds. It's important for us to remember that our minds are very often the spiritual battle or where the spiritual battle begins. Very, very often. And the outcomes of those battles that happen in our minds, they determine the course of our lives. And so the question is this, what do we do? The answer is renew our minds. Maybe some of you know this verse out of Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says this, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your minds. That by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Sorry, I read that wrong, but I just added that for you. The Bible instructs us to renew our minds by allowing the truth of God's word to wipe out anything contrary to it. Old ideas, opinions, worldviews must be replaced. How? By allowing God's truth to continually wash away the filth and the lies and the confusion from our minds, and help us to adopt God's perspective. I think it's important to say here that our protection from the enemy of our souls and all of his evil schemes is not grounded in how I feel in any given moment, but in what I know to be true with my mind. And this is why one of my favorite verses on this subject subject, comes from Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, which says this, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. How do I deal with the various thoughts of my mind? 
How do I bring them under control? How do I wrestle them to the ground when I am experiencing all of these insinuations and accusations from the evil one? You renew your mind with the truth of God's word. You keep your mind stayed on the Lord. The second thing that we can do to fasten the helmet of salvation down tightly, and this fits with renewing our minds, but it's reject doubts that arise from your circumstances. It's true that we are sensory creatures, and so oftentimes if we can't experience something with one of our five senses, it's really hard for us to believe it. And, and so oftentimes, I find myself personally doubting God and his goodness because of my circumstances. Sometimes, circumstances can convince us that God does not really love us or that his word is not true. And putting on the helmet of salvation means that we reject that thought. How? Well, this goes back again to renewing our minds, but the knowledge of our salvation ought to remind us that there is nothing that can pluck us from the hands of God. Look at Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, and if you need something to renew your mind with or preach to yourself, these are good verses. It says this, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, that pretty much covers it, right? Will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The knowledge that we are God's, that we belong to him, that we are kept by him, that we are saved by him, that we are safe and secure with him, is vital to the whole project of the Christian life. With the helmet of salvation, we can choose to believe what appears to be impossible. And then finally, you and I can put on our secure or secure the helmet of salvation when we keep an eternal perspective. The helmet of salvation is the reality that you have been saved right now from sin's penalty. It, it's the reality that you are being saved continually from sin's power. But something that we sometimes forget, and I think that we really need to be reminded of regarding our salvation, is that you and I will one day, day be saved from sin's presence altogether. I like the way that Paul says it in 1 Thessalonians Chapter 5, verse 8, he says this, But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. What is the hope of salvation? It is the bounding hope of future salvation and glory with Christ when he comes again. Worship team, you guys can come on up. The question today that I would like for us to ask is the question that kind of it always is, and that is, what do we do with all of this information? What is it that we should take home with us today? What is it that we need to know as we seek to take these helmets of salvation? And this week as I prepared, I just kept coming back to this reality, and it's a very, very simple truth. And here it is. And I really think that this is what we should all take with us this morning. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. How do I put the helmet of salvation on? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. This is the part where my mom calls me afterwards and says, why didn't you sing the song to them? But mom, I'm not going to sing. Okay. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. It, it's simple, I know, and I want to be more insightful, but this is really the most profound and effective truth. I'm convinced of this, especially when it comes to standing firm in our minds when the enemy attacks us. I was really encouraged this week by the testimony of Charles Spurgeon. And I'm just going to share it very briefly with you. And if you get a chance, I would suggest reading it sometime. You can find it online, the whole testimony, as he wrote it. But when Charles was a 15-year-old boy, he was trying to walk to church. And he got caught up in a severe snowstorm. And so as his story goes, he bailed on the church that he was trying to go to because of this snowstorm, and he ended up attending this very small, primitive Methodist chapel that he had never heard of before. He turned down an alley and was just looking for cover. But it was on the way, and so he ended up in there, and when he went in, there were only 12 to 15 people in this building. In fact, the minister was actually not even there that morning because snow had snowed him in. And 
As he tells it, there was a man there preaching who was just a part of the congregation. And in Spurgeon, in his amazing way with words, he says this. This is a quote. Now it is well that preachers be instructed, but this man was really stupid. Those are his words. <laughs> he was obliged to stick to his text for the simple reason that he had little else to say. Maybe a more diplomatic way would to be to say that he had limited preaching skills, but anyway. But for Spurgeon, when he entered this place, the longing of his heart was only one thing. He wanted to know how he could be saved. He wanted this salvation that we're, but we've been talking about all morning. And the way that Spurgeon tells the story is that this man who was preaching opened his Bible and read this text from Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22. And this is the King James Version, which is what he quotes. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. So Spurgeon says that after that man managed to spin out about 10 minutes or so, he then looked right at Charles Spurgeon and said this, and I quote, then he looked at me under the gallery, just fixing his eyes on me as if he knew all my heart. And he said, young man, you look very miserable and you will always be miserable, miserable in life and miserable in death if you don't obey my text. But if you obey now this moment, you will be saved. He said, young man, look to Jesus Christ. Look, look, look. You have nothing to do but look and live. Spurgeon goes on to say this. I saw at once the way of salvation. I know not what else he said. I did not take much notice of it. I was so possessed with that one charming word. It seemed to me I could have sprang from my seat that instant and sang the most enthusiastic of the precious blood of Christ and the simple faith which looks alone to him. Oh, that somebody had told me this before. Trust Christ and you shall be saved. I love that story so much. Because when the enemy says to you or the enemy says to me these words, you are hopeless you and I can say to him, good thing my hope is not in myself. It's a good thing I'm not looking to myself to save me. My hope is in him. My salvation is found in him alone. I have been saved from sin's penalty. I am being saved from sin's power, and I will one day be saved from sin's presence. When the enemy accuses you and attacks your mind, you look unto Jesus, turn your eyes upon Jesus and say to the enemy, I am alive with Christ. I am redeemed because of Christ. I am forgiven because of Christ. I am reconciled to God because of Christ. I am raised with Christ and I am seated with Christ. And it is all because of Jesus's finished work on the cross. Hillside, this is what it means, at least in measure, to take up the helmet of salvation. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much again for your word. And God, thank you again for the calling to worship you, to look to you, that our security is found in you and you alone, and that the gospel is not self-help. It is a reliance upon you. Lord, today I pray that as a congregation of believers, as the enemy seeks to attack us, that we would find ourselves secure and at peace in the reality that it is all in you. That we can put on the helmet of salvation knowing that you have done it. God, I pray today that we would be a people that look unto you constantly. In Jesus' name.